Well, hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time to see then what is making the headlines with the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the former Conservative Special Advisor Salma Shah with us from now until just before midnight. So welcome to both of you. Uh, to the front pages then, let us kick off with the eye, leading with the Thames Water Saga. Its headline reads, taxpayers may be forced to bail out Thames Water as customers face a 40% hike in their bills. The Express, also about Thames Water, it says disgrace. Fat cat water bosses under fire, reporting the company now needs a taxpayer bailout after shareholders refused to pour in £500 million. The Times is leading with the same story, reporting on the government's message to Thames Water that it must not hit consumers with bill hikes. The Telegraph reports the Prime Minister is under fire after a surprise Easter list hands a knighthood to a donor who gave £5 million to the Tory party. Rayner on the ropes is the Mail's headline, a report on the increasing pressure for Angela Rayner to release more financial and legal details about the council house she sold a decade ago. The food crisis in Gaza makes the front of The Guardian, reporting on the UN court order for Israel to unblock Gaza aid. Daily Mirror reporting on a proposed law to help protect entertainment venues from terror attacks. It's being championed by the mother of a Manchester Arena bombing victim. The Sun is reporting on the arrest of George Gilby's work colleague after the Gogglebox star fell to his death in a warehouse. And the full Nelson, that's the headline on the front of the star for a story about Storm Nelson, which is set to bring, or I think already has, brought snow, sleet, rain and high winds this Easter long weekend. Nelson did seem a strange name, though, did it not? Anyway, uh, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you listen to our guests. So let's head straight to them, to Steve and to Salma. Lots of coverage about Thames Water, not surprisingly, because what is the inevitable result of the financial difficulties they had if they can't raise bills as they would like to, Salma? Yes, uh, this is interesting because there's lots of different aspects to this. So on the front of the eye, you have um, the chief of the water company talking about the need for bills to rise um, in order to, to probably pay for these debts. Um, whether that's just about him or other water companies, I'm unsure. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the other parts of the stories are linking back to potentially nationalising this business. And most people think that that is an inevitability. But Jacob wees Mulk has tweeted this evening saying that actually, in a capitalist process, you go to administrators. And I think there is a missing piece of the puzzle in terms of the reporting, that it's jumping from not getting investment into gosh, the government's going to have to nationalise this entity and missing a big part of the middle where actually administrators could be called in to run this business. Well, the middle part of the puzzle might be the fact that the CEO told um, Ian King today, for example, that they still have £2.4 billion worth of liquidity, which is enough to see us through until May 2025. So perhaps, in his view, the urgency will come in a year's time if they still need to do all this investment, which, as he said, the public is demanding, which is into the billions, obviously. Yeah, and the public are absolutely right to make those demands. There's so many interesting stories around tonight, you know, on the edge of an Easter weekend. The story you've been running about the post office, and this one is about how you deliver public services, how you hold the people to account who run them. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you, you know, the, the, in the mid-'80s, the state monopolies <laughs> were switched to private monopolies mm -hmm. when it comes to water, and it's been a disaster. Um, we haven't had the investment. We can't get the investment now. The shareholders are saying... Do you, think, not... I mean, sorry, do you think it has been a disaster across the board? I mean, the great, you know, Thatcher sell-off of, uh, you know, the little owners owning all these great companies. Uh, where, where you can get competition, it works. OK. But where you privatise one monopoly with, and replace it with another monopoly, regulation has not been able to do the equivalent of a kind of market competition thing. And uh, it, it has been a complete disaster. And, you know, th this weekend people want to go and walk by rivers and so well, they won't be swimming because it would be too cold. But, um, and, and this great asset has been... <coughs> and it does need big investment. But it hasn't been made. The but shareholders Steve, won't make they, it. It, it was, it was privatised in 1989, in subsequent yeah. years. I mean, it hasn't been a complete disaster. I think one of the things that we have to do is review and understand what has happened here, which has forced underinvestment? Let's let's think about actually. Are, you're right on on utilities and provisions that actually people depend on. 
Is there a different type of regulation that government can put on private companies, as we have in housing, to protect social housing assets? Uh, is there a way that you could do that with, with public entities and utilities? Uh, well, private companies that, that provide public services. I think that is an important step before we say that the whole thing was a disaster. Well, so far, I think we can say that those these markets which don't work because they're not markets, I do think it's been a disaster. I agree with you. It's worth exploring possible new regulatory frameworks. But it's not clear, even if you do that, where the money's going to come from. Um, because the government is saying they can't put up the bills because it will be a huge hit to people in the midst of this so-called cost of living crisis. So where's the money going to well, the, the come from through better regulation? But the issue I mean, maybe here... it could be delivered more effectively. But even so, how did you hold these people to account effectively when they run a monopoly? Well, this is the thing. One of the things that you have to ask is... What, what was given to the shareholders? What did the shareholders take out? Well, they say out? they've not had dividends for years, though, to be fair to, you know, to Thames Water. But, but, yes, that's the point. But, you know, then you have to remember that actually it's our pension pots that also are part of the shareholders. Part of the, the, the yeah. contribution to this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so what's actually happened and does that structure work? And, you know... or, or have we got a Victorian water system, as many people have suggested, which does need a lot of investment? Michael Gove quoted in the bottom of the eye there, uh, the levelling up secretary rejected suggestions of higher bills, insisting that Thames Water's bosses had to carry the can for its predicament. How, but how do you carry the can if you don't have the dosh, effectively? Exactly. The Guardian says Thames Water is on track for renationalisation. Is that the inevitability, then, do you think, Steve? Well, I, I, I can't see any other route, but I'm fully aware that um, that doesn't in itself s explain where the money's going to come yeah. from. You know, that because governments are broke as well um, and haven't got... Th that much money, but I think there would be a way of publicly owned companies running things far more efficiently with clear lines of accountability that's been lost with these privatised monopolies. I'm not saying it was a sort of oasis of brilliance pre-privatisation, but I do think there's a model that would be more effective than this. The resources to pay for what needs to be done is an immediate issue. And it's not clear, because the government doesn't want to find the money. Uh, the taxpayers don't and the shareholders don't. But something's got to be done because these rivers and seas are being ruined. Daily Express talks about the fat cat water bosses, you know, quoting the salary. I presume for Thames Water it's cut off, but I presume it's the, the Chris Weston, the chief executive of Thames Water, who says he's fairly new to the business. I mean, it's a hospital pass, isn't it, taking over a, a business with debts like this, to be fair. Um, but he was suggesting they need £20 billion uh, between 2025 to 30, um, which would then lead to that increase of 40%, because customers are demanding, one, brilliantly clean drinking water, and two, um, environmental changes, which is the stuff you're talking about, about the sewage outflows and everything. Yeah, and it's not much to ask, to be honest. I mean, th this, it is expensive, um, and we need a grown-up debate about how we pay for it. But um, in a way, this fat cat stuff, it, that's the easy bit. You don't give them their bonuses and things. That still doesn't answer the question about delivery, accountability, effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, changes in regulation might do it, but I suspect a modern publicly-owned company will end up being the root. I think, just to make one final point, the headline here is actually very difficult for people in business because fat cat bosses, you know, the, the salary is £850,000 a year, which is enormous, absolutely. But this is a mammoth task, and to try and attract people who are going to take this on, they do have to have the correct remuneration. And I know that doesn't, that's not going to be popular, but if we're going to ask talented people to come in and fix these problems, then the remuneration has to be correct. And it, it is a private company at the end of the day. And, and, but they have to be talented. Yes. Uh, so, you know, when I remember the London and underground, they brought in a load of people from New York and they really made a huge difference. And it was worth paying every halfpenny, however much it cost. Mm -hmm. This lot, to justify £850,000, have to really rise to yeah. the challenges, and there's not much evidence that And it's worth are. noting it is not globally typical to have a privatised utility company known as Water, which is uh, what we need. Yeah. Shall we move on to the Daily Telegraph? A um, couple of stories on the front there, one of which is an honours row. Now, first of all, what is this honour? It doesn't seem to be a New Year honour or a birthday honour. Why has it been given, and who is calling the furore on the front of the Telegraph? So, um... 
Yes, you're right. So new, normally you have the New Year's honours, the monarch's birthday honours and dissolution honours. So it is unclear to me even now, having read these stories, as to which of those bits it fits into, although it might create some speculation, as Steve and I were discussing earlier, mm -hmm. as to whether this might be dissolution honours. Um, but there have, has been some um, issue with uh, a... Conservative Party donor who gave the party £5 million last year who's been awarded a knighthood. Um, and so there are there have been demands from Labour previously about this donor asking for the Conservatives to, re to return the money. I don't know what the logic is behind that, um, but it certainly uh, created some issues for Rishi Sunak. Um, Alongside this, you've got um, MPs who've been given gongs as well. Yeah. Philip Davies, uh, one, Mark Spencer, another, and uh, Tracy Crouch has been given a damehood. And inevitably, there are questions about, um, you know, the gongs that are going to MPs and those who are retiring as well. So uh, it's not it's not been the best round, I'm afraid. Yes, the businessman is um, Mohammed Mansour. Uh, he is listed as his Knights Bachelor. I've got it here. A businessman, philanthropist, and senior treasurer of the Conservative Party for business, charity, and political service. But the five million makes it look like patronage is the problem. But the Telegraph is suggesting. What does this lead to in terms of when Rishi Sunak might go to the polls then, Steve? Yeah, well, in effect, they're sort of saying that one possibility is he's fully aware that he's running out of time because there might be, who knows, a June-July election. But even in October, he's beginning to uh, feel that um, time is running out for him to dole out honours to the people one way or another who he considers to be worthy of them. So it's not part of any of the normal formal honours yeah. announcements. It's part of this, to be honest, fan de siècle feel at the moment, that we're moving very fast towards an end. I can but, see but... the strap now, fan de siècle. <laughs> yes, fan de siècle. I always pronounce it wrong, fan de siècle. Um, but, you know, this issue keeps on coming, doesn't it? Donations, knighthoods and so on. I mean, it's... It, I, I'm, I, I think it's you've got to have state funding of these parties. It's just not going to go away as an issue. I don't think you should have state funding of the parties, but I definitely think that people should review and be a little bit more transparent on the process around honours. Uh, and, you know, people that we think that are worthy, and not just the great and the good, but actually people who go out there and do charitable work, I think they're more worthy of knighthoods and damehoods. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That's another big debate, isn't it? Um, yes, yes. We've got more uh, Tory uh, news to come, but also ahead in the press preview, uh, does Labour's deputy leader Angela Rayner have questions to answer over her property dealings? Well, welcome back. You are watching the press preview. We are joined once again by Steve Richards and Sal Michel. Welcome back to both of you. Back to the Daily Telegraph. Um, and uh, one of the more right-wing elements of the Conservative Party has come out and actually been secretly recorded, one presumes, saying that actually criticisms by reform of the Tories are fundamentally correct, fascinatingly. Yes, this is Danny Kruger MP, who is the co-chairman of the New Conservatives, which is one of the one, many factions in the Conservative Party that doesn't seem to like Rishi Sunak very much. Um, but this is a recording of him uh, essentially talking about reform, um, you know, hitting the right buttons and the Conservative Party no longer being conservative. It's one of those refrains that you hear quite frequently. Gosh, if we, only we were much more conservative. Um, and, of course, it's on the front page of The Telegraph that is um, the Conservative Party uh, parish rag, I would, I would describe it as. Um, but what's interesting about this is that clearly the sort of... Uh, naysayers in the Conservative Party against Rishi Sunak are not being dampered or quelled. In fact, they're finding new routes and new ways to be able to talk about the fact that... And recording that, each other. And recording each other. <laughs> uh, to talk about how reform, you know, if we were just a little bit more like reform, perhaps we'd be better in the polls. So um, there's a lot more of this push, I think, to come. Yeah, and in the meantime, um, the, the Daily Mail, still after Angela Rayner, uh, on the ropes, the paper says now, after, after what's been dubbed Council Housegate now, is it, Steve? 
It's, mm. uh, it reminds me, I'm not saying the outcome will be the same, I don't know, but it reminds me of the pursuit they had with uh, Keir Starmer when the Durham police investigation went on into whether he... It, they put him on the front page every day for days and days and kept the thing going until it stopped when the police said he didn't break the COVID laws. Mm. Oh, because he was filmed, no. wasn't he, drinking a beer? Yeah, office, yeah, and, and it was uh, just on the front page of the mail every yeah. day. Now, maybe this will prove to be different, but I think the most interesting thing is Keir Starmer, who can be very, very cautious, as we all know, and can equivocate if he feels the need to equivocate, has been unqualified in his support for Angela Rayner in this issue. Um, and, you know, you could find a form of words that leave us the door slightly open that the male are onto something and he hasn't. But, but, but is so... the male onto the fact that she is seen as a weak link, partly because she's left-leaning and therefore sort of splits that centrist message that Keir Starmer is trying to to get at, do you think? Is that why she's in the spotlight? I, I think she will be a target, even if this goes nowhere. Okay. I think she will continue to be yeah. a, a, a target, unfairly, probably. Yeah. Now, um, it's rained forever, as we all know, uh, but the star has decided to pick up on the fact that it's snowing, which actually feels different at last, doesn't it? Uh, snow, sleet, rain, the full Nelson, this is Storm Nelson. Got some pictures from Devon, actually, uh, where it has been... I don't know if it's unseasonable or not, but anyway, it's been cold, hasn't it? There we go. Wow. Uh, snow falling in Devon, as you can see on the streets. Happy Easter, <laughs> as everybody's <laughs> saying. <laughs> oh, dear, as far as I'm concerned, anything that breaks from the rain is a good thing. But anyway, Sal... <laughs> yeah, so the thing I find really interesting about this is um, The Star, a red-top newspaper, is essentially covering what is a story about, to me, climate change. So it, it is telling its readers that this is not only uh, something that's going to hamper their enjoyment on the, of the bank holiday weekend, but also, you know, it is one of the wettest um, years that we've had on record. Uh, and the fact is that this is not normal. So I, you know, kudos to the staff for, for doing this story in a way that I think is much more accessible than most climate change stories. Well, the Met Office says uh, more snowfall and sleet overnight, uh, issued a yellow weather warning for wind for parts of Somerset and Dorset. It's Easter. See you in a bit. It's Easter. Four days off and looking forward to that guy there, you know, deck chair. Oh, I've got to get to the forecast. And <laughs> you've got to do the forecast. Makes forecast. it even more miserable. <laughs>